You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Imagine a universe with hundreds of stars, thousands of planets, bustling space stations, huge empires, and you, a tiny company with barely enough money to survive. What would you do? Thanks to today's sponsor, you can do more than imagine it. You can play it. Prosperous Universe is a space trading simulation played entirely through a highly customizable user interface, which allows you to manage a company from your web browser on any desktop computer. Indeed. I'm the CEO of my own spacefaring company, Anna, on a quest to explore the galaxy and maximize profits. According to my records, John, you're not currently profitable. What? Why does it say your business name is Opossum Enterprises and your slogan is No Jam G Trading? What's that supposed to mean, Anna? I almost forgot my favorite part, John. The goal of myself and the Opossum, of course after complete dominance, is banning all trades to and from your company. Well, isn't that lovely? And certainly not how I'd play, but that's one of the many cool parts of Prosperous Universe. You can play however you want. Also, I have to say that its emphasis on realism and everything from the economy to space travel is pretty impressive. You can either run your spacefaring business into the ground, like John, or play how I do, by completely crushing your competition into dust. Isn't that lovely? Come join Prosperous Universe by clicking the link in the description below. The game will never be pay to win, and free users can enjoy the game for an unlimited time. Prosperous Universe is the space economy simulator. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Ryan Lynch. Dr. Lynch is an associate scientist at Green Bank Observatory, where his research focuses on studying pulsars in large radio surveys. He studied astronomy at Penn State and received his PhD at the University of Virginia. In 2011, he began a postdoc at McGill University and is now an associate scientist at Green Bank Observatory. Dr. Ryan Lynch, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, Doctor, you work in radio astronomy and you work on one of the strangest objects in our universe, pulsars, originally discovered by Jocelyn Bell Burnell which she should have won a Nobel Prize for that. But the study of pulsars affords us the study of some very unusual material in the universe, which is neutronium. This is an environment unlike anywhere else. Can you give us a kind of an overview of what's it like if you're sitting next to a pulsar? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it because you would die in multiple different ways. So I guess it'd be a race to see what can kill you first. So you're right that pulsars are among the most extreme objects in the universe. They are the remains of a star which started off its life more massive than our own sun and then exploded in a supernova, which are the most powerful explosions or among the most powerful explosions in nature. But not the entire star is destroyed. You can get the very dense core of that star remaining, but it's too heavy to support itself and it collapses into a very small dense object until finally basically the the neutrons that are normally found at the core of atoms kind of get squeezed too tightly together and then they go no i don't want to be any more close together to those other neutrons they're a little bit shy and they actually provide the outward force that's uh, necessary to prevent that that neutron star now from collapsing all the way to a black hole Although if that neutron star was a bit more massive, then it would collapse to a black hole. So when you get this neutron star, this, the remains of this, this dead star that ended its life in the supernova explosion, you are talking about something which is about one and a half to two times the mass of our sun, which is about half a million times the mass of the earth. But it's only about 10 to 20 kilometers in radius. So it's roughly the size of a city. You can think of it as, as a large-ish kind of city. And so the equivalent density of the material 
is like taking every single human being on the planet and squeezing us into the size of a sugar cube. So 7 billion people in, the, in a sugar cube is pretty much equivalent to a lump of neutron star material. Although obviously at that point, you are not people anymore. And we don't actually know how matter behaves at those densities. So this is kind of an open question. So in addition to being very dense, um, they're very hot. Typically they start their lives off with temperatures of tens of millions of degrees. They have very strong gravity. So if you got close enough to them, you would just get squashed into a pancake on the surface of the neutron star. So again, you would cease to be normal human material. And they also have really, really strong magnetic fields. So the strongest magnetic fields in nature. And the pulsars and neutron stars with the strongest magnetic fields are called magnetars. And if you were to place one of these at the distance of the moon, it would destroy the Earth just through its own gravity. But it would also erase all the credit cards on Earth just because the magnetic field would erase the little magnetic strip that you find on, on the back of credit cards. And if you got close enough to those strong magnetic fields, uh, it would also rip all the water molecules out of your body because water is slightly magnetic. And so the magnetic field alone would be enough to basically desiccate you. <laughs> And, and I, I should also mention that they emit X-rays and gamma rays um, often, which would also, you know, just do terrible things to your insides. So lots of different ways that the pulsar could kill you if you were close enough to it. So don't, don't nestle up too close. But the flip side of that is that these are physical environments that we absolutely cannot recreate in a laboratory on Earth for good reason, and also just for technical reasons. We, we don't know how to, to create those conditions even if we wanted to which means that pulsars are some of the best natural laboratories for studying extreme physics. Now, extreme physics, the pulsars are also known to be sort of beacons, lighthouses. And they initially, at the time, it was sort of toyed with that they were artificial in nature because they repeated so much. But it's really just a rapidly rotating object that's shooting a jet out. What is the nature of the jet from the pulsar? What creates that? Is that the magnetic field? Yeah, so you're absolutely right that um, we use this word pulsar. It's more of a, it's really rotation. So we often describe them as being interstellar lighthouses. So th they're very highly magnetized, like I mentioned. So if you kind of imagine any pictures you've seen of like the magnetic field of a bar magnet, or if any of your listeners have ever played with like iron filings, you sprinkle them around the bar magnet and it kind of shows you what the, the magnetic field is like. It kind of loops from the North Pole to the South Pole. And pulsars have a similar kind of shape to the magnetic field. And near that north and south pole, you can get electrons and positrons, so, so charged particles, electrons we find in atoms, positrons are their, their antimatter equivalent. And they can be accelerated, so they move very, very quickly, close to the speed of light along these magnetic field lines. And when they do that, they give rise to uh, radio waves. The detailed process um, by which that happens is not entirely understood. So this is another thing that's interesting to study with pulsars. But we do know that they do produce these radio beams, which are almost like radio lighthouses. And then as the pulsar is rotating, if that uh, radio beam points at the Earth, we see a pulse of radio waves. And as you mentioned, they are very, very regular. The rotation is very stable. So people say that you can set your clock by how uh, regularly Old Faithful, the geyser in Yellowstone National Park erupts. Well, you can almost set an atomic clock by the regularity with which pulsars rotate. We also see X-ray and gamma ray emission coming from pulsars, uh, which probably occurs in a slightly different region around the pulsar, but which itself is, is also very regular. So we see these regular pulsations in radio and in X-rays and gamma rays. Now in radio, looking at a pulsar with Green Bank, and you're, you're looking at the pulsar, what what does the radio signal from that look like? Is it extremely broadband, meaning does it just cover the whole radio spectrum? Yeah, so in radio astronomy, in astronomy in general, we often will see sources that emit at a very narrow range of, in, in radio, we often use frequency to describe kind of the energy of the, the radio waves we're picking up. Wavelength is an equivalent concept. Energy actually is also kind of an equivalent concept. And we would refer to those kind of narrow band spectral line sources oftentimes is the way you hear that referred to. 
Um, but we also see sources that emit over a very wide range of radio frequencies, and pulsars fall into that latter category. They're not equally bright at all radio frequencies. They are brighter at lower frequencies, and we tend to observe pulsars at frequencies of about 100, a few hundred megahertz up to a, a few thousand megahertz. And just to put that in perspective, an FM radio station has frequencies, which is which are around 100 megahertz, roughly, you know, plus or minus 10 megahertz. So, you know, few times, maybe a few tens of times higher than the, the frequencies that you would use in a car radio. Now, let me try and characterize that down a little bit further. So you have pulsars, which are just beaming out broadband. And then you have much more narrow band type things like, say, hydrogen, just neutral hydrogen emitting. So that's more narrow band, even though it's still sort of broadband as it smears around and moves. And then finally, you get to very narrow band, which is the realm of SETI, right? Mm -hmm. So the <laughs> how many channels do you do you use when you're when you're studying a pulsar? I mean, to cover those frequencies, how many millions of channels are you monitoring? We tend to think of it more in terms of like the total bandwidth, the total range of radio frequencies that we're covering. And that kind of depends upon what your center frequency is. And there's some in instrumental limitations, but a few hundred megahertz up to maybe a few thousand megahertz is not uncommon for observing pulsars. Now you mentioned this, this concept of channels. So we split that radio band into smaller individual frequency bands called channels. And we do that for pulsars because it can help us to detect pulsars that might otherwise be invisible for reasons that we could go into if you want, as well as to allow us to kind of throw out certain frequency ranges that are contaminated by human generated radio waves without losing an entire data set. But for pulsars, we don't tend to use a very, an excessively large number of channels. So a few hundred to a few thousand would be typical, but we're not usually talking about millions. In regards to interference from humans, this is something that obviously plagues study left and right. But in studying pulsars, how bad is it? And as, as things get worse <laughs> with satellite constellations, things like that, is it just going to get very difficult to study pulsars? It's already can be difficult for sure. And so the Green Bank Telescope where I work and which is a really fantastic instrument for studying pulsars is located in something called the National Radio Quiet Zone, which means that there's actually some regulatory protection at both the federal and state level to try and minimize the amount of human generated radio interference signals that might hurt the telescope and the data that we're collecting. But it doesn't protect you from everything. Mobile devices are hard to protect against, satellites are hard to protect against, aircraft are hard to protect against. So it does make our life difficult. And oftentimes we just have to basically throw out information at the frequencies at which we see a lot of interference. For pulsars, that doesn't mean you can't do any science because pulsars emit over a wide range of frequencies. If we have to small uh, throw out a small subset of those, we can still detect the pulsar. But it does mean you're losing some data, you're, you're losing a little bit of, of signal, a little bit of sensitivity. Where it becomes more of an issue for pulsar astronomy is when you're trying to find new pulsars. Because what you're really looking for is something which is repeating with some sort of uh, interval, but you don't know what that rotational interval is, what that repeating interval is ahead of time. So that's something that you have to search over. It's a parameter that you have to search over. There are computational techniques for doing this efficiently, but if you also have interference, which is changing or modulating on similar timescales, then it can often appear in at least like a naive first step of this process as if it were a pulsar. And we then have to look at other characteristics, the signal, and oftentimes just look by eye in order to differentiate between human generated interference and an actual astrophysical source, or at least a candidate source. And so that process just is, is difficult to completely automate. And we've gotten better at it. There are some you know, pretty sophisticated machine learning algorithms out there that can help you with this, but you still oftentimes need a person to sit down and look at the data and make a judgment. And that just takes time and people and eyeballs. Uh, but it is also a great way for people to get involved in the process. And so we have had a lot of success getting students involved, even high school students, to help us with this process. And they've discovered pulsars themselves. So. Uh, it does make life difficult. It doesn't make it impossible to do our science. In terms of how it's going to be going forward, 
Yeah, I mean, as mobile devices get more and more common and with 5G operating at frequencies that historically were relatively free of interference and with satellite internet, basically going to blanket the planet with, um, with radio signals that are used for internet communication. It's just going to get worse. And, but at the same time, these technologies add value to people's lives. And so we have to find a way to coexist. And that's actually something else that I'm kind of tangentially interested in is looking at ways that we can more efficiently deal with interference when we can't get rid of it entirely. We always would prefer to just not have it there in the first place, but sometimes that's not possible and you have to do the next best thing, which is to find ways to maybe just throw out a subset of the data and and hopefully lose less of it um, or something like that in order to still do your science. Well, we do have a saving grace, a possibility the idea of a radio telescope on the far side of the moon and just block out all the emissions wholesale. Is that, that, is that the direction to go? I think it's a direction to go. So there are technical challenges to doing that, obviously, but it has been studied and there are ideas for how you might do it. You know, without, if you were to just go up and maybe drop antenna from an orbiting spacecraft, that would potentially work, but you need to be able to place them precisely And how precisely you have to place them depends upon the frequency or the wavelength that you're observing at. And so this would probably work okay for lower frequencies, lower radio frequencies, but it wouldn't work so well for very high radio frequencies, um, at least unless you could devise very precise ways of controlling where the antenna land or or, or, uh, move them around after the fact. And without people there to actually characterize all that. You know, maybe one day with drones or something like that, it would become feasible, um, but, but it would be technically challenging. And it's also certainly going to be a lot more expensive than building a radio telescope on the Earth. So I think that there are certainly some, uh, some science applications where that would be really, really beneficial. And in fact, there's things that you can only do in an environment like that um, at very, very low radio frequencies, the atmosphere, really the ionosphere, so charged particles in the upper layers of the atmosphere, really block the radio waves coming from space. And so you can't do that kind of science from the ground. But I think that if you want to build the biggest possible telescopes, which we often do, because pulsars are very, very faint. And so we need a lot of telescopes with a lot of collecting area in order to detect them. If you want to do that um, at the frequencies that we tend to be interested in or, or most interested in, there's always going to be a very important and probably even primary role to play for ground based telescopes here on Earth. Now, anomalies in pulsars. So we know of this population of pulsars out in the universe, and there's some theoretical work about things like neutron stars inside of of, uh, red giants, thorn side cow objects, and things like that that we haven't yet seen. Have you seen anything anomalous? Are there weird pulsars out there that are behaving not intuitively? Yeah, absolutely. So my, my, my postdoc advisor, Vicki Caspi, who's at um, McGill University in Montreal, I, I once heard her say, and she may have been paraphrasing this from somebody else. So uh, this, this may be a double quotation, but I'll, I just remember it from her that um, for objects which are so close to black holes, pulsars have a surprising amount of hair. And what she meant by that is that you, you may have heard of this idea called the no, no hair theorem in black holes, which basically means that all black holes are pretty much the same and can be described with just a few parameters, their mass, their, their spin, potentially charge, but we don't think that they would have much of that. But for pulsars, we see an incredible variety of different types of phenomenon. So the profile shapes, what uh, basically, um, when I say profile shape, it, it's basically the shape of that radio beam. It's not a, a pure, simple, like lighthouse beam. Um, there's structure within that. There's uh, certain parts of the beam which are brighter than others. And exactly why that's the case and how you come up with a model that describes all of the variety we see, we, we haven't quite done that yet. I've already mentioned that we don't know exactly the processes that are giving rise to pulsar emission in the first place, what's really going on in that very strong magnetic field in detail. Uh, how the the different charges are being accelerated and replenished. We don't know what the interior of the pulsar is like. We don't know what matter behaves, how matter behaves at those densities. Um, There are different models out there that predict um, how matter would behave at those densities, and they all predict like a maximum mass for a pulsar after which it would collapse to a black hole. But we don't exactly know which of those is right, and we don't know what that maximum mass is. And then we also just see pulsars do weird things sometimes. So there are classes of pulsars that 
turn off and turn on at seemingly random intervals, and we don't entirely understand that. We think it has to do with the fact that they're getting close to the end of their radio emitting life, and something about the, the, the mechanism that gives rise to the radio emission is starting to kind of falter. We see changes in those pulse profiles, so changes in the structure of the radio beam, and those tend to be, or they can be correlated with how quickly the pulse is spinning and how quickly it's changing its rate of spin. And so that has something to do with probably the, the magnetic field around the pulsar. Sometimes we see things that are not necessarily related directly to the pulsar, but are related to the effects of material in the galaxy as the pulsar travels to the Earth. So we often think of Earth, uh, space as being empty, and it is close to being empty, but it's not completely empty. There's gas and dust and plasma in space, and that plasma in particular can affect pulsar signals. And sometimes, something passes between the Earth and the pulsar, and it gives rise to these weird effects in, in the pulsar signals that we see. And that's very difficult to, to model because that structure, the material in between the Earth and the pulsar, there's not very many other ways to kind of like map that out and, and really see it in detail. So those are just a few of the things that we see. There's also pulsars that exist in interesting environments. So we often find them in orbit around other types of stars, uh, oftentimes white dwarfs, even other neutron stars. And so those environments can often be very extreme where we see interesting general relativistic effects that are happening and they allow us to study different theories of gravity. So basically every time that we do a survey and find new pulsars, and I should say that we know about 3000 of them so f uh, right now, and we think there's probably something like 100,000 in the galaxy, roughly. So, so we only know a few percent of the total population. And every time we do a new survey and find new pulsars, we tend to find something which is new and unique and interesting and that we can use to do some really cool science. Now, the weird thing about pulsars is that when you start crushing matter down to those densities, you get the material neutronium. And this is something that we can't possibly ever have a sample of. So how heavy is it? So I mentioned that the equivalent density is something like taking all 7 billion people on Earth and squeezing them into the size of a sugar cube. If you figure that, you know, a typical person maybe weighs like 150, 200 pounds, somewhere in that range. You know, I mean, we're talking at that point something like a billion, or no, yeah, a billion, I think, yeah, pounds for just a single teaspoon effectively of material. So really, 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 really heavy. So what happens if you lift it off the neutron star? Now you probably can't physically ever do that, but just hypothetically, if you mm -hmm. lift the material off the neutron star, does it explode or can it possibly be metastable? We talk about metallic hydrogen in planetary science and how it, we think it's metastable, so it's very dense, but can you get a sort of the same thing going with neutronium or does it just explode and kill you? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I'm not 100% sure of the answer, but I think that if you were to actually try and extract a sample, I mean, the whole point is that the gravity of this neutron star squeezing it so tightly that binds up the matter in that ultra dense state where the only thing that's um, keeping it up is the fact that the neutrons don't want to get too close to, together. It's an effect called neutron degeneracy pressure, um, if you're interested in the technical term. And so if, you know, if it's no longer subject to that very strong gravity of the surrounding material, it doesn't have the weight of all of the other neutron star material crushing it, then I think it would probably just explode uh, under, yeah, without that, that counterbalancing uh, inward force. Gravity is good in that case. Well, gravity is good in all cases. We need it. Now, what is the mechanism? Okay, so these, the, the, a neutron star has, or a pulsar, has this enormous magnetic field, as you mentioned, what is, how does it generate it? I mean, when you look at it, like a planetary magnetic sphere, magnetosphere, that's very different of a process compared to what's going on with the neutron star. So what do you guys think is generating that extremely powerful magnetic field internally in the, in the uh, pulsar? So an astute listener might have caught on to the fact that we're talking about neutron stars and the material that pulsars are made out of is being uh, made of neutrons. The neutrons are electrically neutral, so you wouldn't get a magnetic field from them. So the material that makes up the neutron star is not actually 100% neutrons. There are other particles in there, so it's mostly neutrons, and that's what's kind of providing the outward force to keep it up. So there are charged particles and 
probably other kind of quantum mechanical structures that get weird when you squeeze matter that densely that give rise to the magnetic field. Why is it so strong to begin with? Well, pulsars are born from massive stars, and we know that stars have their own intrinsic magnetic fields as well. And when you collapse something from a very big state with a relatively weak magnetic field to a very small state, the magnetic field gets stronger. Um, there's a concept called conservation of magnetic flux. So basically, if you take something big and weakly magnetized and make it small, the magnetic field strength goes up. So that's at least part of what's going on. But we also think that when the star that gives rise to the pulsar is undergoing that supernova explosion during that process, there are other things happening in the core that help to amplify that magnetic field known as a dynamo process. And we think that that's also probably um, amplified magnetic field even further. Yeah, even having said that though, not all pulsars have the same magnetic field strength. So some of them, I mentioned magnetars, have the strongest, strongest magnetic fields known in nature, and they can be you know, hundreds of thousands of times stronger than the magnetic field of a typical pulsar. Then the other end, we have a class of pulsars called millisecond pulsars. And they're called millisecond pulsars because they rotate once every few milliseconds, which is faster than a typical pulsar. And they have magnetic fields that are weaker by, you know, about a thousand times or more than a typical pulsar. And we think that what's happening there is that to get a millisecond pulsar, you start off with a dead pulsar, and then it kind of eats some material from a, a nearby companion star. And as it eats that material, it spirals around almost like uh, water circling the drain before it falls onto the dead neutron star. It then transfers angular momentum, so spin, onto that neutron star, which makes it spin faster, hence the millisecond periods. But it also does something to suppress the magnetic field strength and weaken it. And then that's how you give rise to a millisecond pulsar. Now, the environment around a pulsar is a post-supernova environment. So if, if you had a star system that had planets and the supernova occurs and what's left is a pulsar, is there any hope that they would survive as cinder planets around this pulsar or, or are they simply gone? Yeah, so we know of one pulsar that has a something, I guess what you call a planetary system around it. They're probably not, we would not at all expect them to be habitable planets, both because you know, the star went through a supernova explosion, their sun is, is gone, also because the radiation of the pulsar would make them pretty nasty. Um, but it also might be better to think of them as the remnants of planets that probably um, just kind of barely survived in some form, the supernova explosion. But we don't see evidence for planets around the vast majority of pulsars. So if there were planets around those stars to begin with, they probably typically are destroyed at some point during the life cycle of that star or when the pulsar is made in that supernova explosion. With pulsars and, and neutron stars in general, do these give us any insight given that they're there you could almost call them almost black holes but not quite do they do they give us any insight on what the singularity of a black hole is like i mean can you glean any clues on black holes from neutron stars maybe indirectly so we have a theory to describe gravity called general relativity einstein's theory of general relativity which has passed every test that we have thrown at it, including many with pulsars that are kind of unique and really cool. But we know that that can't be the final word because we also have another you know, kind of fundamental theory in physics, which is quantum mechanics. And that has also passed every test that we've thrown at it on kind of the, the microscopic, submicroscopic scale. And these two theories don't uh, play well with each other. So there must be something deeper going on. And if we could figure out what that sometimes called like the grand unified theory or theory of everything that would describe and kind of unify both quantum mechanics and general relativity, it could potentially give us insight into what might be happening uh, at a singularity or inside a black hole. And pulsars, because they have super strong gravity, are some of the best places that we have to try and do tests of general relativity in order to see whether the predictions of general relativity match up with the observational data that we get from pulsars. And we can do extremely precise tests with pulsars because of that very regular rotational period. So you can think of the, the 
pulses that we uh, receive from a pulsar is almost being like ticks of the clock, which are extremely, extremely reg regular. And if we see a deviation in when that pulse arrives at the telescope from what we would predict, it tells us that there's something unexplained, unaccounted for, either with the pulsar itself or that's affecting the signal as it travels to the Earth. And oftentimes we can look for patterns in those deviations and we can recognize, oh, that's due to the pulsar being in orbit around another star. And so there's a, there's a very typical kind of um, way in which that would affect the data that's easy to recognize. And then you can, you can actually measure some of the properties of that system by looking at how the arrival time is of the pulse change, of the pulsar changes over time. And so the, because those arrival times are usually so regular, we can detect very, very tiny deviations, which tell us about very subtle, small kind of effects. And that's why we can test general relativity um, and try and see if other theories of gravity would be a better description for what's going on with incredible precision with pulsars. But so far, general relativity, like I said, has passed every test that we've thrown at it. But if we could find some prediction of general relativity that doesn't hold up, it's, it's possible that that would help shed some light on what um, a deeper theory might for gravity might be. So if you ever find a discrepancy, it points to new physics. Exactly. Now, situations with pulsars. Now, can you have a situation where you have a double pulsar? In other words, two of them orbiting each other. And can they go through a merger, I guess a kilonova, if, mm -hmm. if you're talking about neutron stars? So do you see that? Do you see double pulsars and... Do they merge? And if they do, what happens? Yeah. So yes to the first question, we do see a double pulsar. We know of one system in which we see both the neutron stars in that system as pulsars. Uh, we see other systems where we have a pulsar with another neutron star. We infer it's a neutron star um, because of its mass and because we don't see any sign that it's like a white dwarf or a normal star but we don't see radio pulsations. And that could just be because it's not emitting radio waves or it could be that it's emitting radio waves, but that radio beam doesn't point at the earth, in which case we wouldn't see it as a pulsar. So we know of several systems like that, but only one where there's two, two things we see as pulsars. Uh, do they merge? So uh, yes, they can. And we have observed two neutron stars merging, but not because they were pulsars that we watched spiral together. In that case, what we detected were gravitational waves, which are ripples in space-time. They're the equivalent to electromagnetic waves for gravity. And the LIGO experiment has detected mergers of two neutron stars, Virgo as well, which is a European experiment, very similar kind of techniques. Those were systems that were outside of our own galaxy, so they weren't within our galaxy. Could those two neutron stars that merged have been pulsars? Very, very possibly, but they were too far away for us to actually see any kind of radio pulsations from them. In terms of what happens afterwards, so you get a very violent explosion, which you can then pick up with different types of electromagnetic telescopes, seeing things like uh, gamma rays and radio afterglow, the, the merger, a bunch of different, different types of uh, wave bands participate in something like this. And the ultimate remnant would probably end up being a black hole at that point. So you would have two neutron stars and they would merge. And once things settled down, you would probably have a black hole left over. Radio astronomy in general, it has been an exciting time the last few years for radio astronomy because a lot of mysteries have shown up, odd radio circles. And now this detection by ASCAP of radio emissions from near to the center of the galaxy. What, what do you think of that? Yeah, so that's a really interesting discovery that was announced recently by ASCAP, which is a telescope, an array of telescopes in Australia. And it's an interesting object that we don't really have a great explanation for what it is. So I should say I was not on the team that discovered this, but, um, but I'm familiar with their result. And what they found was a radio source, like you said, it's close to the center of our galaxy. And it kind of comes and goes. It's what, we're, what we would call a transient. So it kind of like appears and then it fades over time, it can reappear. The emission in some ways looks like it could be from a pulsar, except that we don't see any pulses from it. And that could be because the pulses are kind of getting smeared out so much that we just kind of don't see the pulsed nature of them anymore. So that is something that, that can happen. 
But we also see other changes in the radio emission that you don't typically see in pulsars or even in magnetars all the time. Magnetars can, are, are these class of very strongly magnetized um, neutron stars, and they can emit radio waves, and they, they tend to look a little bit different than normal pulsars. And in some ways, this, this galactic center object kind of is magnetar-like, but you would expect to see the pulsations if it was a magnetar. And it's also not detected in like X-rays or gamma rays where you typically see magnetars. Uh, and also doesn't behave like a normal star, which is radioactive either. And when I say radioactive, I don't mean in the like nuclear radiation sense. I just mean it's active in the radio. And so we do see stars like that, but this, this object also has some properties which are kind of like that, but nothing quite completely fits together. And so it's a bit of a mystery in terms of what it is. It could be a, a phenomenon that is entirely new, that we don't really have a good physical explanation for yet, which is also, which is always really exciting because I mean, as astronomers and the scientists, we're always looking for new things that weren't previously known. That's, that's why we're in this business to begin with. So I think it's gonna require more observations at a wider range of radio frequencies to maybe narrow down exactly what this object is, but it could remain a mystery for some time. Now, do you see, this is a question of distribution. Now, do you see more occurrences of pulsars and neutron stars in general towards the galactic center, presumably where you had more material for more bigger stars and things like that? And, or, and do they fade out as you get into the outer reaches of the galaxy? So what does the distribution of pulsars look like? Is it just completely random or is there a pattern? Yeah, so it's not random. So, so our galaxy is disc shaped. Most of the material is in that disk, but you know we do have things which are kind of up above and below the disk. And so most pulsars are found within the disk of the galaxy. And we do expect there to be a large population of pulsars close to the galactic center, but they become harder to find when you get close to the galactic center. Basically all the other material, uh, that plasma that I talked about earlier, there's so much of it that it can kind of smear out the pulsar signals and make them very hard to detect. And so we would love to find pulsars that are like right smack dab in the middle of the galaxy, very close to the black hole at the center of our galaxy. That would be fantastic for doing all kinds of, kinds of cool uh, tests of gravity. Uh, but that has remained elusive. But we do see most pulsars still within the disk of the galaxy and concentrated roughly you know, more heavily in the direction of the galactic center. The millisecond pulsars I talked about were a little bit different. They're older objects. I mentioned that they're dead pulsars that kind of brought back to life. And so when a pulsar is born, it often can kind of get a kick from that supernova explosion and it gets, flat, gets uh, shot off in one direction at a high speed. And so over time, it will travel away from the place where it was born and travel out of the, the disk of the galaxy. And so millisecond pulsars, because they are older population, tend to be distributed uh, a little bit more evenly they're not as heavily concentrated in the disk of the galaxy as the younger, longer rotational period pulsar population. One of the great mysteries, current mysteries in radio astronomy is the fast radio bursts of which there seems to be two kinds of uh, flavors of these days. Can you think of a way that neutron stars in general could be at play in the generation of the fast radio bursts? Yeah, so fast radio bursts are these as the name implies, bursts of radio waves that only appear very, very uh, for a very short period of time, and then you'll they disappear and they might they can repeat, but you only see a flash really, and those flashes only last maybe like a few milliseconds. So you mentioned that there might be two flavors. It seems as though there's some that repeat um, and some that don't, and we don't know what causes them. It could be more than one type of thing, but at least for the repeating of fast radio bursts some sort of a connection to neutron stars certainly seems plausible and can even be favored. So the pulses have kind of a duration, which is not atypical for what we see for a single pulse from a pulsar, except that pulsars repeat very, very regularly. Fast radio bursts can repeat, but they don't seem to repeat regularly. We have not detected like a regular separation, that clock-like ticking pattern in a fast radio burst, which would kind of be like a smoking gun for something like a pulsar. It could be that we're only seeing kind of like a subset of the brightest bursts coming from a neutron star and that the brightness is kind of random. And so that kind of masks any kind of regular repeating pattern 
but that's still very much an open question. They also are highly polarized. So polarization kind of has to do with the orientation of the radio waves. And, and we see strong polarization in these fast radio bursts. So their radio waves tend to be aligned in, in preferential directions, which we also see in pulsars. So that's kind of also suggestive. But we also see there was actually just a paper published by an international team using the FAST telescope in China, looking at a repeating, kind of the, the original fa repeating FAST radio burst, looking at the distribution of energy of the pulses. And they didn't detect any kind of repeating pattern, even though they detected a thousand, thousands, of, over a thousand pulses, which is kind of interesting. And then this, this energy distribution is a little bit different from what you would expect. So I think it's, it's very plausible that fast radio bursts, at least of the repeating variety, are related to neutron stars in some way, shape, or form. But uh, exactly what the details of that are certainly is still unknown, and it could be something else at this point. It is one of the kind of biggest mysteries and hottest topics in radio astronomy right now. Hey, doctor, we are almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you one final question. Sure. What are you, what are you doing? What are, what what, uh, what is your research focused on in, within radio astronomy and pulsars? Yeah. So as you as you know, I like pulsars a lot. Um, so I am mostly involved in trying to find new pulsars. So kind of doing big surveys and finding ones that are physically interesting and can teach us new things. I'm also involved in a project called NanoGrav that stands for the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. And this is an attempt to use pulsars to detect gravitational waves. Now, I mentioned gravitational waves previously. There are these ripples in space time. In this case, we would be looking for, we are looking for gravitational waves from supermassive black holes. So the biggest black holes in the universe, they're kind of doing a death spiral around one another before they merge. And the, that would impact the signals that we get from pulsars by causing the, the pulses to arrive a little bit earlier, a little bit late compared to what we would expect. But the deviation is only probably on the order of like tens of nanoseconds over the course of many, many years. Um, so it's a hard thing to measure. And you have to look at lots of different pulsars because what you're really looking for is a particular kind of relationship between those early and late arrival times between different pulsars, depending on where they are in the sky. So that is one of the biggest projects that we do here at the Green Bank Telescope. We also made heavy use of the Arecibo Telescope. Unfortunately, it collapsed um, last year, so we can't use that anymore, but it was an extremely important telescope for our efforts, and we're still using data from it, so it's still very much contributing. And so that's something else that I'm interested in. My job as a scientist at the Green Bank Observatory also just really involves trying to help keep the telescope at the cutting edge of technology and of science. And so we are currently building some really cool new instruments that are gonna be super useful for studying pulsars and fast radio bursts. One of these is a new receiver. This is an instrument that actually collects and detects the radio waves and kind of sits up at the focal position of the telescope. And so this new receiver, it's called ultra wideband receiver. So it observes a wide, very wide range of radio frequencies um, instantaneously. And this is a project being funded by the Moore Foundation. And it's just going to be a fantastic pulsar instrument once it is fully up and operational, hopefully sometime next year. I'm also interested in kind of new processing tech, data processing techniques that we can use, particularly with pulsars to try and study them in more detail and study mentioned like that plasma and space that affects the pulsar signal that can be kind of annoying uh, thing uh, sometimes but it can also be a rich source of information about the structure of the plasma in our galaxy as well as uh, new ways of trying to detect and get rid of the um, human-made radio interference which again is kind of annoying but but there are some interesting signal processing techniques that you can use to try and get around that so it could still be kind of intellectually interesting so i'm basically interested in any cool science we can do with pulsars and cool new instruments and techniques that we can use to do better science both for pulsars but also just anything that we do with the green bank telescope in general you know it's a fantastic telescope that does a wide wide range of different types of science and i just want to make it work as well as it can all right, Doctor, we are out of time. Thanks for joining us today. That's fascinating work. And I'll tell you what, if I really want to imagine 
an absolutely horrible environment in this universe. It's right near a pulsar. And I think I think I would actually prefer to be closer to a black hole than a pulsar. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you'll come back sometime and thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction John, author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. Be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What? <laughs>